This week in Jamaica now, Army Captain booted from the force amid controversy over his role in the Pathways International. Ballistic tests confirm that the weapon of a policewoman was fired during the deadly October 17 ritual at the church. And posthumous charges? The record will show that even though the person was dead, the person was responsible for the murder for whatever offense it was. Attorney says it is an overkill to criminally charge her client, Pastor Kevin Smith, after he's killed in a car crash. What upsets me because today is Kevin Smith, tomorrow is somebody else. The latest in the rural region make a college contract controversy. Witness breaks down during testimony as Klansman gang trial enters the third week. More Pfizer vaccines arrive in Jamaica and vaccinated spectators to be allowed for the next Reggae Boys World Cup qualifier at the National Stadium. I'm Damian Mitchell and this is Jamaica Now. The Jamaica Defense Force, the JDF, has parted ways with Captain Omain Morgan, who has been linked to the controversial Pathways International Kingdom Restoration Ministries in St. James. Army spokesman Lieutenant Nathan Curtis says the Defense Board gave approval for Morgan to retire his commission in the force effective October 27, 2021. On Tuesday, the JDF announced that it had launched an investigation into allegations that a service member was associated with the Pathways International Restoration Ministries. Sources told the Gleaner that on the night of the alleged religious ritual on October 17, the captain and a policewoman were in their force-issued uniforms when they escorted past the Kevin O. Smith in his BMW SUV from his Coral Gardens home to the Norwood Avenue Church. The captain was the driver while the policewoman sat in the front passenger seat. On reaching the church, she reportedly exited the vehicle and opened the back door for Smith to get out. The cop remained at the church, but the captain left. And ballistic tests have now confirmed that the gun of the policewoman was fired on the night of the deadly ritual at the Pathways International. A male congregant murdered during the incident on Sunday, October 17, was shot and stabbed. The throat of another congregant, Tanika Gardner, was slashed. Highly placed sources close to the matter say spent shells recovered from the scene matched the weapon of the policewoman. On the night of the incident, head of the St. James Police Division, Senior Superintendent Vernon Ellis, reported that a pistol and ammunition were seized. He also reported that the police were shot at as they tried to enter the Pathways building to rescue congregants. They had to call in reinforcement. <laughs> Meanwhile, attorney at law Valerinita Robertson is raising concern that the public is being misled by reports about criminal charges being laid posthumously against the religious leader Kevin O. Smith. Smith died in a motor vehicle crash on Monday in St. Catherine. He was being transported from St. James to Kingston to face murder charges. Two members of the Pathways congregation were killed during the ritual. Deputy Commissioner of Police Fitz Bailey told the Gleaner that the dead church leader was posthumously charged to bring closure to the case. Posthumously charged means that the person, the charges were laid against the dead person. So if you committed a murder, mm -hmm. So to bring an closure to the murder, you have to be charged. So to close out the file. So the record will show that even though the person was dead, the person was responsible for the murder for whatever offense it was. But Queen's Counsel Valerie Nita Robertson, who represented Smith, said there is no provision in law for charges to be laid against a dead person. What upsets me because today is Kevin Smith, tomorrow is somebody else. Not a word has been said to me. So you don't know cause of death? You nothing, don't... nothing, nothing. And, my, and the family wants uh, 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 their own pathologist to be present. The Rural Reed Jamaica College issue has taken another turn as the school board has written to the education minister saying it cannot terminate the substantive principle. Reed has been on special leave. It expires on November 20. Mr. Reed is also before the courts on fraud charges in relation to the Caribbean Maritime University. This week, the Education Minister said the Jamaica College Board would have to make the decision regarding Reed's future. But the board said it was shocked at the Minister's claim because, based on the education regulations, it does not have the power to dismiss Mr. Reed as no complaint was made while he was performing his role as principal. Board Chairman Michael Bernard said any cause for complaint during Mr. Reed's tenure as minister might be known to the current minister and others, but he said that evidence has not been formally submitted 
as a complaint. In the Klansman Wandan gang trial, the second prosecution witness broke down in tears on Friday while speaking about a member of the Wandan gang he described as his best friend. The witness is a former member of the gang. And for a roundup of this week's hearing, we're now joined by court reporter Tanisha Mundell. Tanisha, the first witness has now completed his testimony and cross-examination. What was the approach of the defense? Well, basically, the approach of the defense was to attack the credibility of the witness. And they did this mainly by pointing out the inconsistencies between his evidence and his statement given. So there were a number of inconsistencies to which the witness um, admitted to. Some of them were omissions. And uh, so the lawyers made a case that he's making up um, these accounts that he had given. And they said that he fabricated a story so that he could benefit from not being prosecuted himself. The witness um, pretty much denied all of this and he insisted that um, he's, um, he's testifying to help Jamaica and that he's not making up any of this. He was adamant that he's telling the truth and that he left out some of the details because he was scared of the gang. But now that they know his identity, he's revealing everything. Well, last week there were concerns about COVID and at least two of the accused. How were those concerns eventually resolved? Last week, only one witness had COVID. The reputed leader did the test, but it came back negative. So only one witness had the virus. Um, initially, the judge had said that um, they would set up and allow him to join remotely. But after consulting with the health authorities, they indicated that that could not go. So we had to wait until he was out of his quarantine period. And so far, what has been the highlight of the second witness to testify in this matter? The second witness to the sign this week and the highlight, I think, so far has been that he broke down in tears while um, sharing an account of his best friend who is a defendant in the matter. I couldn't see his best friend, so I'm not sure what his reaction was, but the witness was very emotional. For a minute, he held his head down, and when he came back up, um, he was wiping his face, so he was crying. And he, you could hear it in his voice, so it was very hard for him. He was talking about their childhood. They had been best friends from primary school, and they had maintained this friendship throughout, even after they left high school. He said his best friend joined the gang before him, and he followed later, and they maintained that friendship. And up to even when he was in prison, because he did mention that even while his friend was in jail, he would call and talk to him. So I'm not sure what their relationship is now, but up to the point before the trial, they were still on good terms. He did, though, admit that his friend, that his role in the gang was to collect extortion money. That's what he has said so far about his friend. And what now is your expectation for next week? Next week, um, I expect the witness to start giving an account of the different shootings and murders that he was involved in or yet witnessed. Thank you very much, our court reporter, Tanisha Mundell. Jamaica has received another shipment of the Pfizer vaccines. The health ministry says just over 100,000 doses arrived at the Norman Manley International Airport in Kingston on Friday. On Wednesday, some 45,000 doses of the Pfizer vaccine were shipped to Jamaica. The arrival of the shipments came as the health ministry prepares to resume the administration of the Pfizer vaccine on Monday. The ministry is reiterating that priority will be given to members of the public who are due their second dose. Some 85,000 Jamaicans are due second shots of the Pfizer vaccine. The government has granted permission for 5,000 fully vaccinated spectators to attend Jamaica's World Cup qualifier at the National Stadium on November 16. The announcement reverses the decision on Wednesday to stage the game behind closed doors. Local Government Minister Desmond McKenzie said the final details regarding the procedures and protocols will be announced on Monday. And that's it for this edition of Jamaica Now, your weekly review of the big news stories. Send us your comments at onlinefeedback at gleanerjm.com. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Jamaica Gleaner and on Facebook at Gleaner Jamaica. 
like this video on our YouTube page, subscribe today and turn on your notifications. I'm Damian Mitchell and before we go, American Vacationer says she is still traumatized more than a year after she and her family were padlocked in the Coral Gods Montego Bay Airbnb property on the instruction of Pastor Kevin Smith. Now that I'm finding this out, I realize that, that we were in more danger than we even realized that we were in. You know what I'm saying? And that's the part that makes me emotional because it's like, Lord have mercy. God, if I didn't know that you were real and that you really protect me and my family, you know, from what could have happened to us, I know now, you know? So I'm just grateful. I'm just grateful. I'm so grateful. And at first, when I came home, I contacted a few newspapers and I tried to call a couple of lawyers because I was going to go back and prosecute. But I got so much negativity and so many death threats from Jamaicans. Understand Now, make no mistake. I say this all the time. There were so many Jamaicans that were kind and loving and wonderful people we met. But after I got home, I got threats and death threats and said, if I step foot back into Jamaica, that they were going to kill me. You know what I'm saying? So I decided to let it go. You know, it wasn't worth it. Me and my family were back in America. And that's why it ne I never proceeded from there. But I did reach out to the embassy and they never responded. I did. Everybody, every we, Jamaican. We, we the embassy never responded. The Jamaican Eye Commission? Yes, I, reached, I, wrote letters. I, I wrote letters to them, you know, and nobody, nobody cared about what happened to, to us. So I let it go. And the fact that so many Jamaicans was like, you lying, what were you doing there? Just just neg a whole bunch of negativity, you know, and, and, and now that this has come back, you know, full circle, like I, I have to keep saying, it's a lot of kind Jamaicans who have reached out to me. It's a lot of kind people because I had made the statement that I would never go back. I would never return because it, it felt like the police didn't care. It felt like they didn't give a darn about what happened to us. You know what I'm saying? How do you not write it down? How do you not investigate? How do you not care that this man gave the order to chain us in the property?